Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Enabling Citizens to Navigate the World Around Them. I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Tarbal and Jagera peoples, which is called Kurilpa or Place of the Water Rat. And I'd like to pay respects to the Tarbal and Jagera peoples who are the traditional owners of this land. And I acknowledge this land has never been ceded. On behalf of the Global Journalism Innovation Lab, I'd like to uh, invite you to reflect on the histories of the land where you reside and the impacts of colonisation. And you may like to write a note in the chat function to let us know where you are Zooming in from today. Uh, my name is Michelle Riedlinger and I am a Chief Investigator at the Digital Media Research Centre at the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. I'm managing the global engagement team as part of the Global Journalism Innovation Lab. And today I'm really excited to host this event as part of the lab's new spring speaker series, which brings together leading journalists and scholars to address some of the most urgent questions facing contemporary journalism. So from the invasion of Ukraine to the COVID-19 pandemic to the climate emergency, the world's facing critical global challenges and journalism, public discourse and public, uh, policy dialogues based on evidence-based news and information are essential for tackling these issues. Uh, at a time of shrinking newsrooms and declines in revenue, there's a pressing need for journalists to be able to communicate complexity to diverse audiences in accessible and engaging ways. And today's focus is on the role of explanatory journalism for promoting better understanding of current affairs and complex subjects, and hopefully more informed public discourse and conversation. And I'm delighted to welcome Jibalani Sikahane to speak with us today. He is the editor of The Conversation Africa. And he's, pre uh, he's previously been the spokesperson for the South African Minister of Finance and National Treasury. And he's also worked as spokesperson for the South African Reserve Bank. He's had a long career as a journalist, columnist, and editor of South Africa's leading business and finance publications. And he was a 2002-2003 Nehman Fellow at Harvard University. So our format today is as follows. Uh, Jibalani will de deliver his talk uh, for uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll move to a Q&A period where I'll moderate for the rest of the hour. Uh, please send in your questions at any point using the Q&A function in Zoom. Just select the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and then type your questions. And with that, please welcome our featured speaker, Jibalani Sikahane. Hi, th thanks, Michelle. Um, so should I say good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, because I, I don't know where <laughs> everybody is at, uh, sort of globally. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity um, and for giving us, of giving me and the Conversation Africa this platform to talk about um, the, the role of explanatory journalism. <clears throat> Um, the, the world, uh, I mean, I think I'm stating an obvious point that uh, <clears throat> we all know that the world around us has become kind of fairly complex. And I think it becomes so almost uh, on a daily basis. Um, and that's whether one looks at um, the economy, politics, technology, almost anything uh, under the sun. Um, we therefore need uh, help. Um, as citizens to navigate uh, through all of, of this uh, through all of this complexity and and, and, the, and and one of the complexities actually arises from the volume of information that's coming at us uh, which uh, continues to grow quite exponentially and one of the major reasons uh, why we need to navigate through all of this was actually explained by an American economist, who's now late, uh, called Herbert Simon back in 1971. Uh, in short, um, Herbert Simon said that uh, a wealth of information uh, leads to a poverty of attention. And concluding that uh, consumers of information had to allocate their attention efficiently among the overabundance uh, abundance of information uh, sources. <clears throat> so, that, that, that being the case, um, great journalism can help. Uh, and one of the elements of great journalism, because there are other elements too, is explanatory journalism. 
And explanatory journalism, in, uh, in my view and my experience, and, and in fact, our experience at the conversation in Africa is that it does not only create maps um, that can enable citizens to navigate to the world around them, uh, it can also potentially help citizens manage the problem that uh, Simon was referring to. In other words, this uh, wealth of information um, versus the, the, which leads to the poverty of attention because uh, when there's too much information, uh, people tend to um, uh, kind of switch off. In fact, there's an interesting concept uh, which I came across when I was working for the South African Reserve Bank uh, a couple of years back called uh, the, the um, rationally inattentive public. Um, it's a term that uh, economists have been using quite a lot. And central banks have this problem that um, they would like to engage the public, um, but the the public is obviously rationally inattentive and, and there's a whole range of um, reason relating to that. First, the language that uh, central banks speak uh, puts off many people, leaves them kind of, leaves them out. So, but that's, uh, that, that's a, a side uh, kind of discussion. So at the conversation uh, Africa, we kind of uh, have, we are guided by five key elements uh, when editing copy. And, and um, as you might know, the concept of the conversation which started in Australia is simply this, that um, you tap into the world of academia with all of the insight and the knowledge that's generated there. And you marry that with um, sort of the journalistic skill of editing to try and simplify things and make them easily accessible. So when we edit a copy from um, our authors, uh, we kind of use these five uh, key kind of um, elements. Um, and in no particular order, they are, you know, you, we, we aim to try and, and ensure that the article that we produce or that we've edited does provide a clear picture of what the story is all about um, to, and to make it easier for the reader to, to navigate uh, through the article. Uh, provide perspective or scale. In other words, uh, well, you know, how big a problem are we talking about? Uh, and you, you can map how big a problem you're talking about over five years or over 10 years, or maybe throughout the history of a country or the history of, uh, of that problem. Uh, context and background um, does matter quite a lot. It helps um, kind of illuminate um, uh, things for, for readers quite a lot. Then um, the, the last one is you, you do need to tell the reader what the story means. In other words, why does it matter? And uh, some people refer to that as the so what paragraph. Um, and that, or, well, the last one is then define and explain because um, often you, you come across um, each, each, each profession, whether it's economics or science or science, has its own terminology. Um, often um, that terminology is unavoidable in, in articles that you're putting together. So if you have to, if, if it's unavoidable, well, maybe define and explain it because uh, it helps the reader sort of uh, along. It, it always, uh, well, amazes me, but uh, I understand the reason why, for example, the Wall Street Journal um, will still explain to you what GDP is. Uh, they will write gross domestic product, comma, a measure of economic activity, which, uh, which I always find, wow, it's, uh, <clears throat> whereas the common assumption might be that, well, the average uh, Wall Street Journal reader will understand what GDP is, but they still explain it. So that's what I'm talking about when I mean um, define and explain. So it's these five key elements that help us get as close as possible to explanatory journalism. Um, I say they get us as close as possible because we don't hit the mark all the time. Uh, I'll be first to admit that there are some articles when you go through the website and you find a uh, website, you'll find that ah, actually uh, it may tick uh, one or two or three maybe of, of the five um, elements that I was talking about. And, and part of the challenge um, is, of course, the nature of the conversation. Um, as I explained earlier, it's a partnership between academics and, and us as um, journalists or editors. 
Um, so most of the time, well, we, we have to then to persuade sort of uh, authors uh, to move with us towards explanatory journalism. We win uh, mostly uh, some, but uh, we also lose some. I mean, there are authors uh, in, my, in our experience who said, no, this, this doesn't sound like something for us. Um, so, you know, we, we stuck with that. Then the other point I wanted to make is that most, um, the, the other problem that the, even with explanatory journalism, um, the, the, the problem that you still face is that it will still leave millions of people uh, out. Um, and there are a number of reasons for, for this. Uh, the cost of access, uh, even, even for material that one doesn't need to pay for, like you know the conversations, um, uh, material you don't have to pay to, to access it, but we still leave out millions of people for, for the simple reason that um, access has a cost other than just merely paying for material. In other words, you have to have data uh, on your phone. Well, first, ideally you need a smartphone. Uh, it goes a long way. So that's uh, the first barrier that you, you run up against. The second one is that obviously you need data uh, to be able to log, well, get onto the internet and then uh, be able to, to, to get the information. Then the, the other major barrier is language. Uh, in fact, we had a strategy planning session recently uh, at the Conversation Africa. And um, one of the ambitions that we've set for ourselves is to publish uh, uh, sooner rather than later, I'll start publishing in Swahili um, um, as, 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 uh, as a start. And then we can look at the other languages that are used um, uh, throughout the continent, at least the major ones, for example, in West Africa, Pidgin um, is, is quite big uh, in Nigeria and, and the neighboring countries. Um, obviously, it has its own kind of challenges in terms of you trying to publish in Pidgin because um, there are a lot of variances uh, within the, the West Africa part. So we will be starting with Swahili, uh, hopefully um, sooner rather than later, but um, that will obviously come with its own challenges as well, because one of the challenges is that uh, knowledge and information is often produced in English or French, which are the two major kind of um, languages, um, uh, at least um, based on the, 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 the data that I have. Um, so the indigenous languages have not kept up with, um, with these kind of advances, um, at, at least uh, they, they, they've not kept up. Uh, and secondly, even where they have kept up, um, you, you would find that the, the term, their terminology, in other words, has not developed a wide usage, which is in the experience and the challenge that I've faced in South Africa, um, because one of the things that I do on the side, I write a column uh, for an Isi Zulu language newspaper, uh, which is based uh, in Durban, but circulates um, um, through, throughout the country. Uh, and it's called Ilanga, which um, would mean the sun in English. And um, the challenge one faces is that uh, a lot of the terminology in, uh, because I write a column on business and economics, and a lot of the economics terminology just doesn't exist uh, in, in, in the Sizulu. Uh, and interestingly, um, that's one thing that has uh, made me or forced me or well, made me gravitate more and more towards explanatory journalism because I have to explain everything. In other words, if you use a concept, um, for example, um, um, th there's no Isisulu word for recession. In other words, when you're writing about uh, the latest um, data coming from the statistical agency on how the economy has performed. So you then resort to explanatory uh, kind of uh, ways and, and try and find ways of explaining what, what you might mean by a recession. Sometimes you do um, sort of uh, revert to uh, metaphors uh, if they are useful metaphors. But the problem with metaphors is that uh, they can uh, limit the, the, the audience um, that, that you, you can talk to. And secondly, even if you find some um, other words that you can use in the Sizulu, 
One of the challenges with the indigenous languages is that because um, of urbanization, uh, there's sometimes wide differences in terms of how the language is spoken in the urban areas versus in the rural areas. So that also presents its own challenges because you, you, you now need to try and, and cater for both audiences without alienating one uh, over the other. So we, which does um, um, create um, the additional problems. So, so I foresee kind of similar problems with uh, Swahili when we start publishing in Swahili that we might run into similar problems. Uh, although the, the saving grace with Swahili is that um, because it, for example, was um, the, the, it is the, the main language, uh, official language in, in Tanzania uh, for many years. So, and obviously what was the main language of, of communication even for commerce. So a, a lot of uh, the economic terminology, for example, will have been translated into Swahili. So that will save us. But I wonder whether it's actually kept uh, up with, with, with uh, kind of the new developments and new terminology um, that, that's come up. Um, well, there almost comes up every, every year around whether it's economics or science or any other sort of technical subject. So those are some of the, I think, some of the challenges that, that one faces, but maybe to speak also specifically about uh, one of the issues that we were chatting about just before the official uh, start of the seminar. One of the challenges that we face as the Conversation Africa is that obviously we, we are the only um, site um, in the Conversation family that covers uh, an entire continent, um, or at least that's the ambition because we, we, we try and cover as much of it as possible at this stage. But um, the, you, the, the 52 or 48 countries, depending how you um, segment it, uh, 48 if you're looking just at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, is always that um, all of these countries are very similar uh, in so many ways, but they're also very different in so many ways. Um, one of the major differences, for example, is that um, the state of universities uh, and therefore, which has an impact on what kind of research or who the ability to do research varies quite a lot. So that obviously creates problems. And um, uh, we also find that um, a lot of academics uh, will come back to us and say, yeah, well, since you guys don't pay, uh, in other words, for people to write for you, um, I've got very limited time because I've got an overload of teaching that I'm doing. So for me to write for you would mean I'll be taking off my um, leisure time. So, but you don't pay, so that sort of thing. So th that, that does um, obviously make our um, explanatory journalism ambitions kind of blunted uh, to, to some extent because uh, not, not every, we're not able to get content um, from, from every country that we would ideally would like to kind of um, help the rest of the world plus the citizens of that country sort of understand what's going on. The, my, my starting point has always been, and I'll explain where this starting point comes from. My starting point has always been, for example, that when it comes to economics, uh, everybody participates in economic activity. It's whether as workers, consumers, employers, or, or in any other capacity imaginable. Yet the discussion about economics um, often, leave, of, often leaves most people feeling that, well, this is not for us. Well, GDP happened. Sorry, something popped up. So GDP uh, happens over there uh, and we are here. So while well, they're having this discussion about the economy, so it's, this discussion is not, is not about us, right? Um, and, and, and where this starting point comes from is that some years ago, um, I, I was um, in the village where I grew up, uh, sitting with uh, peers, um, and some, some of the folks were slightly older than me, and, they, they, and all of them were unemployed and they were having this discussion about increases in petrol prices in South Africa, um, which there had been quite a lot happening as it is um, the case now. And I found the discussion very interesting because obviously the one, one, they didn't understand how the petrol price um, is calculated, but they were having this animated discussions about the reasons 
uh, at least from their understanding of, of why petrol prices were going up. So I decided not to explain to them you know, how it works. I thought, okay, let me just sit back and listen and, and see what they conclude. And, and, um, and, and that discussion stayed with me over the years, um, has stayed with me over the years. And, and until kind of a couple of years back where I concluded that actually what it was telling me is that even unemployed people uh, are interested in uh, economic subjects, um, but the way we discuss them, the way we write about them, the way we debate these issues is exclusionary. Um, well, largely because of the terminology and maybe even the platforms where these discussions are taking place. Um, so if we want to reach um, as wide a population as possible, um, one has to find uh, ways of overcoming um, th these barriers, um, whether it's terminology, whether it's the platforms. Um, I say so also mindful of the fact that uh, obviously not everybody, uh, in other words, um, is going to be uh, pulled in into these discussions. Hence why I say we need to reach as wide as possible, um, because so some issues are of no interest whatsoever. Uh, maybe like, like, for example, a decision by a central bank to in increase interest rate, short term interest rates might not anim animate the same um, kind of passions amongst um, my, the, the group that I was talking about uh, as, 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 as the petrol price increases might. Um, so you will have those differences. And I think um, that I'm, I'm quite happy with, with that. Uh, I don't think we, we can overcome that. So um, let me stop there for now and see if there are any questions um, uh, or comments. Thanks, Jibalani. That's great. Uh, so we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the event. So you can uh, send a question by selecting the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'm hoping you all know how to use Zoom by now after all our uh, COVID time. And uh, you can type a question there and uh, we'll do our best to get through them. And so can I start with a question just about given the broad scope of the conversation Africa, I'm just wondering about pitching because pitching is such an important part of journalistic work. So topically, geographically, how, how does an editor go about reckoning what stories to publish or what issues to pursue given the wide range of interests across all these areas? Oh, sorry, you you muted it. Sorry about that. Yes, I muted myself. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we have kind of, um, would first the, the conversation Africa started in Johannesburg. So we started as a small team in Johannesburg of six, seven people. It has since grown to 26 now. So we have a team in and that sits wow. in Nairobi. We've got a team in Lagos. We've got uh, one person in Ghana and we've got one person in um, Senegal um, to, because we're slowly building up uh, the Francophone side of things. So we, we then have meetings uh, where kind of all of these uh, teams are then fit back uh, in, into the system. And then we, we then have to decide. So we, we have a policy, we try and strike um, a regional balance uh, when we're putting content together, like for example, uh, the, the newsletter that goes out every morning. Um, that, that balance might not be on a daily basis, but uh, it might be on a weekly or even a monthly basis. So try and make sure that we, we, we have that regional balance because based on copy flows and how quickly authors respond, that, that kind of will limit us in terms of um, ensuring that we, we, we strike that balance on a daily basis. So, so we, we, we then, that helps us um, with that, um, to, to manage that diversity of, 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 um, of, of, of the continent in terms of the number of countries and all of the differences that are there. But also we try and pay attention to what's moving. In other words, what is it that people in Nigeria are talking about? and try and, and accommodate it in, in, in the content um, or in, in, in the packaging of the material that we put out. Um, also, we look at uh, obviously East Africa, what is it that they're talking about? Uh, and then we try and make sure that that content 
is reflected in what we do you put see, out. Do you see issues move through the through the countries? Or? Um, they, 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 they do, and they can be similar um, also, or they can be same issues really um, in, in so many ways. Like for example, the issue of uh, food inflation is quite common, uh, obviously right across the continent. Um, but then you will find that each country has its own specific um, kind of uh, circumstances as well that, that would explain, uh, say, for example, food inflation. And Nigeria, if I, as an, an example, uh, has for some time, a number of years now, had its own peculiar uh, kind of set of circumstances which uh, have driven inflation over and above the global factors, like, for example, the issue of security uh, in the north has meant that um, farmers uh, have been limited in their ability to move crops uh, down south, uh, which is the, 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 the economic hub um, of, 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 of Nigeria. And then there were some other fairly specific government policies as well um, that um, uh, I think they stopped imports of certain food items to try and encourage um, sort of domestic production of those items uh, without um, much success, but then that has meant that then the prices of those items uh, has, has had to go up because they, they are in short supply. So those are kind of fairly specific uh, to Nigeria. Um, South Africa may have its own uh, also specific set of circumstances. Uh, similarly with, uh, with Kenya, which uh, for the last two, three years, if not more, has had uh, a swarm of locusts uh, and also some drought in parts of, of, of Kenya. So those will be sort of um, fairly specific to, to a particular country, but broadly the issue of food inflation is quite common right across. Um, issues of energy um, are common right across. Obviously climate change would be common right across. So, so yes, there are differences, but there are also similarities. So that helps often. I want to come back to climate change, but we've got a question here uh, in the Q&A, so I'll read it out. How important is social media versus, great question, how important is social media versus uh, personal contacts in your daily work when keeping track of relevant news topics across Africa? How do you, how do you keep on the pulse? We, we, we do, I mean, reference uh, social media. Um, it's noisy, uh, as you know, kind of often heated. Uh, often there's a lot more dust, um, heat than light uh, you know, on, on social media, but um, it, it can provide you with some useful signals uh, to certain things, but you, you shouldn't uh, um, take it um, at, at face value, in, in, in my view, I mean, and uh, unless you you talking about the social media um, kind of posts of um, a central bank or a Ministry of Finance, in other words, the official sources. Um, other others, um, the, the, you 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 would kind of see. Oh, there's a lot of dust um, that's that's come up uh, over that particular issue, and then we'll then kind of use that as a signal, okay, let's go in and see what, what exactly is going. So what we've, um, we tend to do is we may call a few of our, of our authors on that particular subject and say, hey, look, we see that there's this thing happening here. Um, what is your understanding of the issue? And that will then help us. If that particular author we've spoken to can't help write an article, he might then also refer us to either to somebody else who might be able to help us or we do a search uh, on the internet for research, who's done research on that issue uh, most recently. And then that we will then use that as a basis for approaching that author to, to see if they can help um, shed some light on that particular, e particular issue that, um, uh, that sparked all of the dust uh, <laughs> on social media. Yeah, so so, so what's, your, what's your balance between uh, accepting or, or, or pitching, so it, so authors who pitch to you versus your commissioning, going out and uh, asking authors to write an article. What's your balance? I know it's probably um, dependent. I don't remember the, 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 the data now, but um, when, when we started, we were obviously 100% um, us calling, <laughs> harassing academics <clears throat> and asking them to write for us. 
Um, th that's changed quite quite a lot um, over the years. I mean, over the seven years that we, we've been uh, publishing, um, we we have a lot of uh, content that gets offered to us um, by people pitching. Um, um, sort of story ideas, and then uh, we have a small committee of four editors, senior editors, who then go through the pitches, and then we will uh, decide which ones we accept. Um, we, yeah, I think we... in Australia now, for every every pitch, you know, it's one in eight that get accepted. You know, it's it, because it's been going for so long. So sometimes it's yeah. a matter of time, you know, before yeah. they. Yeah, and then also I think it's a it's a matter of um, in Australia's case, I mean the state of their universities as well. So yeah. that you know, relatively all of the universities are in good shape relative to um, to where most of the universities on the continent on the African continent will be. So that's a great we, point. Yeah. We don't have that luxury yet um, of <laughs> of turning that many away. Um, so we probably tend to accept uh, probably 80, 85 percent uh, of what we what, what gets offered to us, uh, although we, we do engage with the authors to try and, and steer them in, in the direction in which we, we think uh, the, the, the material ought to focus on, because sometimes the, the pitch, uh, you may find that it's slightly off. Uh, the topic a little bit or slightly off, uh, off focus, out of focus. So we'll have to negotiate with the author to try and bring it to the kind of focus that we think would work for a yeah. generalist audience. Um, the the journalistic authors, flair. Yeah, and, and, and most authors I find uh, are quite uh, open to um, kind of the, to that sort of nudging. Some obviously uh, will kick up a storm, but you know, most, most are fairly open. Yeah, they want, they want to engage. Uh, we've got a question here in the chat. Uh, I'll read it out. According to a widely used uh, readability measurement, the Conversation Canada is written for readers at 12 to 13 years of education. Does the Conversation Africa similarly uh, target readers with at least a high school education? I would say so, um, because we use this the same kind of uh, readability sort of index um, or system, uh, which is quite common across the, um, the, the conversation platform, because um, we all publish on this and edit on the same platform. So it will be the same um, right across the conversation family. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's it it, it helps because you, you know you, you have to aim at something to uh, to try and get the content to um, uh, to to kind of a certain readability level. Um, it, it can at times feel like um, a fairly technical exercise, but it, it it's useful in terms of uh, creating. That, that kind of um, target that you, you can aim for. Otherwise, you will just be shooting into the dark. Yeah, like you said, people caught up with the terminology, um, feeling like it's not for you. Uh, I've got a question here in Q&A. What are the most popular sections of the Conversation Africa, both in terms of readership and pitched articles? So it's um, popularity, yeah. Um, readership, um, we fi I find that politics uh, tends to be the, the most well, 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 kind of well-read, uh, and so is science, by the way, you know, particularly um, thing, things that are explanatory or new developments or new findings um, that have been made uh, by scientists um, looking into you know, particularly those scientists that go out there and look for old things um, that have been buried in the ground or hidden somewhere for many. For Archaeology many years. is huge, yes. <laughs> so, so those tend to be very, very well read. Um, politics, science, um, health. Um, we the, the best readership we ever had um, was obviously COVID-related uh, material, especially in, in the first year that it hit. We got quite uh, quite lots of of readers for it, um, but then in subsequent years as well, whenever there's been a new development, like a new variant found, that that has tended to be very kind of uh, have quite a, a good readership, um, which is kind of fairly um, well spread across uh, across the world. Uh, and then um, business and economy as well. I mean, doesn't do that badly. Um, interestingly, uh, it depends on the topic and the issue. I mean, if it's a topical issue, 
and um, the article kind of uh, <clears throat> is pitched, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at the right level, it will attract readership. Um, the, the other um, segment also that gets very well read is arts and culture and society. Obviously, we, there you're, you're writing about music, uh, about artists, about sometimes books, well, books as well. Um, so the, the arts and culture also gets, um, gets very well read. Um, then environment, environment and energy, um, depending on, on what the issues are as well uh, and how topical they are. Then, but, but the, 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 <clears throat> the common, common denominator uh, throughout all, all of it all, if an issue is what the nation is talking about or is what's in, on the front page or on the newspapers or the kind of big developments around it, it tends to get very well read. Do you have any evergreen articles, the ones that keep on coming back? You know, they've been published quite some time ago, but they people keep on coming back to them through Google searches or other issues like that? Yeah, no, we, 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 we do. We, we have one, um, in fact, one or two. That, that uh, In fact, the one was uh, on aluminium foil. Um, I can't remember now the, what the, the article says, but it was it's on aluminium foil. Um, we published it probably either within the first year of, of uh, setting up the conversation in Africa, and uh, it pops up almost every year. Uh, I don't know who, who's looking out for it and reading it. Um, so that's one example. And then we have one which we've established the reasons why it comes up. Comes up. It has popped up every year for the last three years. And we've worked out that the reason it pops up uh, right at the beginning of each year is because of school assignments. Um, so we haven't worked out whether the assignment is at a university level or amongst high school students. But the article is about the impact of drought um, on this African economy. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we sit at the beginning of each year and watch say from about late January, uh, early February, it starts picking up readership. So it will kind of until end of March, early April, and then it tapers off and then they, they go away. And then every the following year, they'll come back again. So- um, <laughs> Somebody's asked a question about the comments and do you see ongoing conversations through the comments and the articles? We, we do. Um, also, it, it varies um, the, the, the engagement there, depending on the issue. I mean, obviously, some issues are more of interest to more kind of specialist audiences. So you will see commentary coming from those. Um, like, for example, when we um, do coverage of the Tigray kind of war in, um, that's in Ethiopia, um, you get quite a lot of animated conversations and in fact shouting that can take place um, on, 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 on the platform around some of those issues because um, the, lot, it, the lot of passions um, sort of attached uh, to what's happening there uh, from the diaspora or even people who might still be living in, 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 in Ethiopia. But um, some of it obviously has to be moderated um, or even we close comments when when things are running amok or running away uh, in terms of uh, people becoming too emotional uh, and not engaging with with the subject matter in a more kind of considered fresh fashion. So yeah, uh, although we, we haven't had to do much of that lately, but um, there have been instances where we had to shut comments because uh, um, some participants were really um, getting uh, uh, kind of fun behaving very badly. Uh, do, you, do you follow any social media conversations using the conversation articles? In terms of explanatory journalism, have you seen how people are using those articles in social media conversations? Um, well, I've, I've, the, 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 the three platforms that are kind of social media platforms that, that I, I tend to follow kind of personally will be obviously Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Um, it's a bit difficult to tell whether then, because maybe the conversations might be taking off, taking place off the platform itself, although people will have picked up the continent, say on LinkedIn or Twitter, and then the conversation might be taking place elsewhere. 
So I, I haven't noticed um, or come across any specific uh, conversation taking place. Um, although anecdotal evidence, you know, there's stuff that you then pick up when you move around <clears throat> in, in, in kind of physically in certain circles, we would then tell you um, that people are using the content for, for further discussions. Um, some would use it uh, for assignments to help their school kids um, when they're doing assignments that will kind of help them with some of the explanatory <clears throat> material that they may need to be able to, to understand either a particular subject, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm interested in your take on what's happened with Twitter recently, but we got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so we'll come back to that if we've got time. Uh, have you experimented with audio formats, perhaps partnering with uh, radio broadcasters? I know radio goes wide. Yeah, look, radio remains the most important platform, I think, on the African continent, um, as, as it probably would, would be in, in most other countries. Um, we've, uh, for how many years now, two, three years, been doing uh, podcasts. Uh, we call them Pasha. Um, so we, we've done that. And then we've just started uh, <clears throat> a sort of the article reading, in other words, having embedding audio of the article in the articles themselves, uh, which we hopefully will be scaling up um, shortly. Uh, and then the, obviously the other ambition is to do, ensure that um, most articles are kind of multimedia kind of uh, rather than just one, one, um, one, one medium. Um, Pasha has done reasonably well, uh, but it needs to be scaled up, in other words, uh, so that we can produce it uh, on scale um, and, and, as, <clears throat> and ensure also consistent quality throughout. Uh, so that, so how big is it now? What's, what's the audience reach? Um, I think the probably highest uh, listenership we've had on one kind of podcast will be what, 10, 10 12,000? Um, it, it, we need to kind of really um, grow it uh, and, and ensure that we're producing um, that, the, the, those podcasts consistently uh, because we, we haven't been, for, for staffing reasons really, we, we've not been able to, uh, to, to be consistent. I mean, we, we are donor funded, so that, that also does come with its own limitations. You can't grow the team <clears throat> as, as fast uh, as you'd like to, so you have to fundraise at some point. Oh, yeah, the value that. proposition, and uh, that's where the explanatory, yeah, the benefits come in, but yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a long term. Yeah, so it's a long process, so, but we, 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 we are working on it um, because we, 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 we thought that if the, the more kind of audio um, content we can produce, the easier it will be for us then to start uh, working with radio stations. Yeah, that's right. You've got something to show them. We've got something to also something that they can just plug and play. I mean, if they so need. Although what has been happening is that we found that, particularly in South Africa, but this might be the case in in the other countries where we operate, that radio stations will take the content and then call the author. Um, sort of say, well, you've written this article, blah 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 blah. So can you talk to us about it? So at least we, 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 we do have a relationship with radio kind of, uh, however indirect it, it, it might be at this stage. Uh, ideally, we, we would want a, a much closer sort of working relationship, particularly with the bigger um, sort of um, radio station owners on the continent. Yeah, so maybe we'll come back to that, thinking about republishing and rebroadcasting, but um, I've got a question here. How much collaboration potential do you see among the different uh, conversation platforms worldwide? Well, there, there, there is already a lot happening. Uh, for example, there, there's been a big project around uh, climate change, uh, the climate change conference that took place last year, for example. So there was a, a globally coordinated uh, coverage of that. So the teams uh, from the various, uh, well, from these various uh, conversation sites were working together to produce content, which we then uh, publish across um, all, 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 all the platforms. But, but outside of also of things that were, we were working on specific um, collaborations on, on uh, producing content, we, we publish each other's content anyway. I mean, we, 
we, we, we have, as the Conversation Africa, we have a lot of readership that sits in the US and others, um, you know, so, 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 so we, we, we kind of get that benefit of being a part of the global uh, platform anyway, and we will use a lot of the content uh, that the rest of the Conversation uh, team will, will produce. In fact, in our newsletter, um, you would see that um, it will be the African content, and then there's the international at the bottom, which is the content that comes from, from the other countries, which helps. Um, like, for example, I mean, the, 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 what's going on in, um, in, in Ukraine, uh, we, we rely largely on, on, on the rest of, of the conversation family for what they're reporting, and they'll cover that. We will then just focus mostly on what the impact is on the African continent, um in terms of food prices and fuel and that sort of thing but for for the rest of the coverage we'll get it from the rest of the family so that would be the same for COVID 19 and uh yeah. and also climate change you'd you'd look climate at some change. of the global but local but yeah local. global and, and local combination of those two because um so in fact i find that a lot of our readers even say for example people i know in south africa who also would go to other sites, sister sites, and read things up. And then some of them will tell me about something that I haven't even seen myself. Say, hey, did you see that article? It talks about this. So, so, so readers um, also do that kind of um, navigate uh, the entire sort of uh, global uh, conversation platform and, and they find things uh, there as well. Um, so. How much do you think in terms of republishing or rebroadcasting that adding benefit? I know, I know for Australia that the now public broadcast ABC, The Guardian, these articles get, you know, a lot of republication. Do you see that in terms of trusted sources or other sources as a way of reaching a wider? How's that going for you, I guess? I, I feel like that's one of the models for the conversation. And so, yes. yeah, there are hurdles there or? No, it, it is a big part of what we do. So we, we, we will have a unit that focuses on, on working on republishers. Um, so reaching out to them, showing them how, uh, how to publish or republish content um, properly so that we, we can see and, and get the benefit of, of the readership that the, that's coming through that republication. Um, the the sorry. sorry sorry about that the um the 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 challenge um is is about what's happening to media um in general i mean across the continent uh, obviously uh, the traditional media platforms are facing financial um strains so in some instances um the readership has declined, so that, that kind of comes through uh, in some instances, but uh, we still kind of get a lot of readership from uh, republishers, um, uh, mostly in South Africa, but increasingly uh, with, with the nation group um, in Kenya, which is a big uh, a multimedia sort of um, uh, company um, operating out of Nairobi, but which has uh, a footprint across East Africa in Uganda, I think there might be in Tanzania as well. Um, so we, we get that benefit of, of them reproducing our content, which obviously adds to the readership numbers that we get. Uh, also, we're working very hard in, in Nigeria to get uh, republishers there. Uh, and it's, it's a slow grind, but uh, slowly, I mean, we're gaining traction. We also get reproduced in Ghana uh, quite, quite uh, re regularly. Yeah, I was interested in what you said about uh, terminology and uh, that going across regional and national context. Uh, I was in South Africa in 2002 when we had the big solar eclipse. And so mm -hmm. trying to find scientific terms for all the yes. different, for the solar eclipse was, and I, I was wondering about those sorts of challenges for you. We've all learned COVID-19 um, terminology because we've had to, but I'm just wondering if you've seen any of those hurdles. Um, it is particularly if you go into indigenous languages, because I was explaining earlier that, that that terminology doesn't exist, so it has to be invented. For example, in, in Isizulu, um, which is one of the major indigenous languages in South Africa, 
Um, the biggest inventor of uh, new terminology has historically been an Isizulu uh, language radio station, uh, which is part of the South African Broadcasting Corporation called um, Ukozi, which means the, um, is it the eagle, I think, um, or, or the hawk the hawk or the eagle now I can mix my words now so they, they they've come up with a lot of terminology um over the years um to kind of explain or to deal with new, kind of new technical words that are coming into into the system the the the, the only problem sometimes uh, well often is that some of the terminology that's invented um does not have common or wide usage so, <clears throat> which then further limits um, its, its usability in, in other contexts. So a number of universities have in recent years been translating, like for example, um, the University of Wazulu Natal, un the University of the Vedvatasran, the University of Cape Town. They've translated a lot of um, technical um, terminology like in science, architecture, into like into develop uh, isiZulu words for that, um, but the, those terms are not in common or usage or widely used. So yeah, so there's no common reference for people. Yes. So what it requires is a national movement, effectively, uh, for 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 all of that terminology. So you would want all the indigenous language radio stations to adopt it. Uh, obviously, universities. Uh, schools, um, then you, you, over time, that will become part of the national discourse because it will be in common usage. So until you get to that stage, um, you will have these pockets of terminology, however brilliant uh, and well kind of uh, crafted the terminology might be until it gathers that national momentum and gets that national platform, uh, well, regional platform in some instances, because some of the indigenous languages do not travel beyond a particular region. So, but until it get that mass kind of uh, movement behind it, it's not going to get anywhere. So yeah, that's really hard to talk about some concepts. Yeah. Um, somebody, Isaac's posted an interesting project on terminology in African languages, uh, a link in the... Um, I find it fascinating. I find it really interesting to, to think through some of those issues about how you talk about this new science and technology coming out, because it's always changing. Um, but we're, we're out of time. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, I know. Um, and, uh, and I want to get on and uh, talk about our, our next, um, our next uh, uh, event, but please join me. One thing I really don't like about these Zoom webinars is we can't give you applause. So but please thank um, Jibalani Sikahani for uh, speaking with us today. You can clap in your own um, office or lounge room, wherever you are. Um, it's been wonderful. Oh, that's that's the good thing about Zoom. We've got um, uh, lots of appreciation in the uh, chat there. So thank you very much. Um, for a, I'll talk a bit about our next event uh, and then I'll come back. So our next event is on Thursday, 12th of May, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Dr. Yasmin Jawani, the Concordia University Research Chair in Intersectionality, Violence and Resistance, will deliver a, a talk on the journalistic myth of objectivity and consider what it means to write the unpopular. Uh, and she'll be joined by host Dr. Mary Lynn Young, a co-founder of The Conversation Canada and professor of the University of British Columbia. And if you want more information about the Global Journalism Innovation Lab uh, and to register for the next event, you can see some links posted in the chat. Again, thank you so much, uh, Jibalani, for uh, spending the time with us today. I've learned a lot about The Conversation Africa. I, I, I've been a fan and a follower, so it's wonderful to hear behind the scenes and, and see what, you know, how you're engaging with uh, so many diverse uh, communities. Um, and thank you to Shirk for their support for the Global Journalism Innovation Lab through the partnership grant. So thank you again. Thank you very much.